Salute to the B-1 Brigadiers. My YouTube channels come under frequent attack by flag campaigns, white supremacists, and assorted of their fellow travelers who decide that they want to try to silence the truth. We are not going to be spending a ton of time trying to figure out how to make YouTube rich. There will be a migration against away from this white supremacist platform in time. But since this is where the vast bulk of black people are, we try to reach them where they are. So make sure that white supremacy doesn't have the opportunity to cut you off from the truth. Follow me on Twitter. There's a lot of stuff that I put on Twitter that either wouldn't fit into a video essay or it's the kind of thing that's too important to leave it up to the YouTube Gestapo to try to take down. So Twitter is where you're going to be finding a lot of information that simply doesn't get posted on YouTube. The link is below. Now, that said, the last few days alone, just this week, has been an almost non-stop torrent of various tools, fakers, frauds, and phonies of white supremacy being forced to out themselves. See, as the collective pressure of black empowerment, as the collective pressure of the former slaves asserting themselves has continued to build and continue to grow, what's happening is everyone's being forced to have to declare whether they stand on the side of justice or on the side of white supremacy. And a number of individuals who have always been only too eager to buck dance for white supremacy, who have only been too eager to carry water for the oppressor class, now they're being forced to have to declare where they stand. And it's quite a disappointment to some of you who don't pay attention, some of you who turn your brains off, some of you who are weak-willed and weak-minded, oh, you're so surprised, but to those of us who have an IQ higher than our shoe size, none of this has been a surprise at all. This has not been surprising any of it. Now, tonight, what we're going to be dealing with is three individuals in particular. We're going to be dealing with Sheila Jackson Lee and her vomitous support of Jonathan Capehart, one of the proud mouthpieces of white power in the white media. And, of course, perennial idiot Jay-Z. We're going to be dealing with those three as a case study and what the heck's been going on because the last few days has been just a microcosm of how white supremacy has had all sorts of individuals at all levels and all arenas who have been there to tell you and me either what to do, which is sit on our hands and don't fight white supremacy. Don't actually fight it. Go ahead and give a couple of murmurings against it, but don't actually fight it. Or in the case of Jonathan Capehart, just go ahead and roll over for white supremacy. You don't need a check. All you need is an apology. And Jay-Z, this man has never done a damn thing for black people. He has been proudly used as a tool of white supremacy. He's out there talking all that hard nonsense. And then as soon as he's around in a sufficient number of wealthy white men, yes, a boss. Just this week, a lot of you got your little pitiful hearts broken because Jay-Z decided that he would throw Colin Kaepernick under the bus because the NFL was offering him a partnership. Well, it ain't no partnership. That's like saying that John Brown, the slave, had a partnership with John Smith, the slave master. That ain't no partnership. There's never been a partnership between black people and white supremacy. That's not a partnership. But Jay-Z's willing to go along with it because, hey, these are the white folks who made him. Haven't I warned you time and time and time again that if you see some black person who's all who the white media is always heaping praise on and is not attacking and is not undermining and is not running into the ground, there's a reason for that. White supremacy understands the value of taking some shill, some bootlick, making them prominent, giving them tons of positive ink, and then presenting them to you and me and saying, hey, here's a black man who's defying the system. How the hell is Jay-Z defying the system when he's on the cover of Forbes magazine with Warren Buffett, who has not done a damn thing for black people in his entire life? If he has any contact with black people, I think that cover with him and Jay-Z, that was the first contact he's ever actually had with black people. You cannot tell me that you run in the circles of the most powerful white men in the, in the entire world who have not lifted one finger to help black people, who, by the way, through their business ventures, have promoted all sorts of policies that have been disastrous for the black community, who exploit the black community at every turn, who have done their level best to damage the black community and here you are standing next to him like everything is everything 
Now, there's something that, family, you need to understand. Especially for those of you who have followed me for some time. You've probably realized, I hope you've realized, that there's a reason why Professor Truth says the things that he says. There's a reason for it. I don't say things simply to be slamming my gums. But... On the flip side of every communication, there's also what isn't said. And there's a damn good reason for the things that I don't say. I have a reason for everything that I say, and I have a reason for things that you don't hear me say. Just on the issue of black empowerment, there are certain names that you hear me say. Jason Black, Dr. Claude Anderson, Tariq Nasheed, John Henrik Clark. There's a number of names that you've heard me say repeatedly. But there's also a number of names that you have not heard me say. And it's one of those cases of there's a lot of black folks who, as far as they're concerned, the only thing that the Internet is good for is online beefing. That's the only service that that's the only purpose that the Internet serves in their narrow minds. It's a place to come together so you can try to get some attention by trying to take jabs at this or that person. And it's a matter of every time I look up, there's some clown who's telling me, oh, you got to respond to this. You got to say something about that. I don't think that I have to do anything. I choose my targets very, very carefully. There are adversaries and enemies who it is best to fight. There are adversaries and enemies who it is best to ignore. And then there are adversaries and enemies who it is best to contain. Now, what determines the which one that you decide to do? The circumstances. Now, I could have gone ahead and gone on a nonstop jihad against Jay-Z and the rest of these hip-hop clowns. I could have done that, but it's a matter of it wouldn't have made the point to a lot of you. Because I would have had endless arguments about, well, Jay-Z, he gave some money to this black organization, or he did that, well, Jay-Z did this. That's the kind of stupidity I would have gotten from some of you mumble mouth morons. So it's a matter of, this is an, this, Jay-Z's an enemy who it was best to ignore. Why? Because we're not in a position where we can take the guy down, but give him enough time and he would expose himself, especially as we solidify our position. Colin Kaepernick was completely and thoroughly encouraged and he was strengthened and heartened by the support that he knew that he was getting from the black empowerment sphere. And that as he continued to stand his ground and to make sure that his message was not going to be watered down to not compromise on it, sooner or later, white power was going to have to find some of its Negroes who it had on the payroll and get them to stand out front as human shields for white supremacy. In comes Jay-Z. That's no surprise to me. White power has been doing everything they could to laud him because they already knew he, that bastard was on the take. So if you want to know why it is that you never see me encouraging you to try to figure out how do we get some of these well-to-do Negroes to support our agenda? First of all, they're never going to support our agenda. Second of all, you're the source of their revenue. Why the hell would I go to some sellout for white supremacy when I can go straight to the righteous black source? Reaching you is the way that you destroy Jay-Z. White power uses Jay-Z as their sock puppet. They got their hands squarely up his raggedy behind, and he spouts whatever gibberish they want. You got one black man who's trying to take a stand against white supremacy. You got another guy who's trying to make excuses for the fact that he is standing with the very sports organization that black men turned into a multi-billion dollar industry. Apparently, jay Z's supposed to know something about black men starting multi-billion dollar concerns. But for some strange reason, when it comes time to stand with black men who are trying to use those businesses that black men built to improve the lot of black men, all of a sudden, jay Z's going, well, I, I stand with Roger. I stand with Roger Goodell. I, I stand with the NFL. And are we going to be stuck on Colin Kaepernick or are we going to move on to making sure that Jay-Z gets this check? Because I know these white folks are watching and, and I'm pledging my allegiance to white supremacy. Jay-Z did that. He officially pledged himself as a team of whites, as a member of team white supremacy. That's what that little press conference was about. And you notice how they didn't want any cameras in there. Because they knew that somebody was going to bring that up and they didn't want this little moment to be immortalized for posterity.
I've always taught you that white supremacy eventually breaks all of its tools, but they don't believe in breaking their tools until it's time. What good is it to have a tool and break it immediately? You got to get some use out of it first. And Jay-Z, I can tell exactly what kind of monologue he had going inside of that otherwise empty head of his. What he was spouting to that room, that's just basically his rationalization of what he's doing. It was, oh, we're going to be stuck on Colin Kaepernick. We're going to be concentrating on getting Jay-Z some money from white supremacy because that, that's what really matters here. That's what really matters. Now that he understands that he's stepped in it, white supremacy is looking at him and going, hmm. This guy's dumber than we ever gave him credit for. And you never mind the fact that you don't become a tool of white supremacy without being dumb. Smart Negroes understand exactly how the game of white supremacy always ends. Jay Z thinks that he's a smart little. He thinks that he's a smart little tool of white supremacy. See the rest of y'all. Y'all ain't figured it out. See, I I've got it figured out. I know exactly how to navigate my way through white supremacy. I, I know how it is. See, they, they can't do nothing. That's exactly the same kind of dumb stuff that Bill Cosby used to talk. The same kind of dumb stuff that too many Negroes who run around being all chummy chummy with white supremacy talk until white supremacy gets around to them. Once their usefulness is expended, white supremacy breaks them in. You better believe they're going to hold Jay-Z up. When the time comes to break Jay-Z, they're going to all of those those magazine covers that he did cover of Forbes magazine billionaire this that and a third all of those covers are going to come back to haunt him just like they did for bill cosby oh bill cosby's going to buy nbc for a little while there he was going to be a media mogul oh they're already calling jay-z a media mogul yeah which will make it so much better when it comes time to destroy him but that's the future we're talking about why it is that black folks were ever giving Jay-Z any concern in the first place. See, as black people, we got to start learning to recognize danger before it strikes. We got to start learning to recognize our enemies before they attack us. We have a complete failure to recognize our enemies until it's too late. Now, I showed you earlier this week the Gallup poll that was taken last month that showed reparations is twice as popular now as it was in 2002, that almost 30 percent of Americans support reparations. That is a percentile that is higher than it's ever been in the country's history. Reparations is more popular now than it has ever been in the country's history. And this with foundational blacks as the third largest ethnic group in the country, if the white media is to be believed. And I question that, of course, but regardless, I keep telling you guys, this is not going to come down to a matter of raw numbers. It's going to come down to how aggressively we push and promote our interests. That's going to be what defines whether or not we get what it is that we need and what we want. How badly do we want it? How aggressively do we push it? White power has always relied on black bootlicks and sock puppets to try to be our representatives. Get you to sit on your hands. You ain't got to do nothing. The NAACP will speak for you. Created by white people. The Urban League created by white people. Hey, Al Sharpton and his National Action Network, which he relies on white funding for. Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, which he depends on white funding for. Or we're going to have some hip-hop entertainers who get every crumb of their daily bread from white supremacy. This is the problem with organizations that we didn't start. This is the problem with Negroes who we did not pick and we didn't vet them and make sure that they are firmly dedicated to team black empowerment. This is the problem with allowing a bunch of cherry-picked, hand-picked black bootlicks to be our representatives. Letting white supremacy and the white media tell us who represents us. Negroes have this mindless obsession with trying to live vicariously through other people because we think that somebody's going to do something for us. We ain't got to speak up for ourselves. Why, we'll let the NAACP speak for us. And we'll let, why, we'll let white liberals speak for us. And we'll let black entertainers and athletes and celebrities speak for us. And you see what the high cost is of not speaking for yourself. Black people have been playing a game with white supremacy, and the game apparently is that sooner or later, the very Negroes who white supremacy elevated are going to destroy white supremacy, and that what we're seeing is it ain't happening. A couple of days ago, Jonathan Capehart, this clown who you've seen on MSNBC, he's been a perennial fixture there, 
He gets brought on so that he can be the effete Negro male who will sit in the studio and he will give some mild tisk tisks about racism or he'll give some sort of empty insight which doesn't do anything. This guy clearly ain't chosen because of his, because of his brains. He's there to give the black view, the approved black view, the authorized black view from white supremacy. But what's happened is because of the pressure that's been brought to bear, because of the fact that the former slaves have been asserting themselves and forcing tangibles as an issue, forcing the white candidates for the Democratic Party and some of their immigrant friends to be able to have to have to actually say what black folks are supposed to be getting. Even if they're not making any solid promises, the problem happens to be we've made it where we are the ones driving the discussion. We've taken the initiative. They did not want to discuss anything having to do with reparations or having to produce anything for us. They damn sure didn't want to do that, but they were forced to. And now what's happened is we've seen the white power has been trying one increasingly desperate tactic after the next. Uh, we'll get some black celebrities to go up to Capitol Hill and they'll say that black folks don't need a check. Uh, that didn't work. OK, well, we'll get some of these Democrats running for president. We'll get them to say black folks don't need a check. Why? We just need a one size fits all. This is for everybody policy. And if black people are able to apply for it, well, that means that's reparations. That didn't work. So now what's happening is they're bringing out the black bootlicks and saying, you guys better just tell these niggers, tell them you don't need a check. Tell them, forget forget about saying that reparations doesn't have to be a check. Just come out and tell them it, you're, a check is not what we need. We don't need a check. We, just go ahead and speak for them. Just go ahead and say it. And we will point to Jonathan Capehart and we will say, uh, there was this prominent journalist at the Washington Post, Jonathan Capehart, whose credentials are impeccable. That Expect to see all sorts of laudatory praise heaped on this guy. They ain't had a damn thing to say about him before, but all of a sudden they're going to treat this man like he, like he served the second course of the Last Supper. All of a sudden he'll be the most righteous man in America. So they can point to this fool who they paid to write these lies. And then after they've paid him to write the lies, they will point to this same tool and say, this guy, clearly this is the opinion of black people. Well, we can't discount this guy's opinion because look what he wrote, yes, in their own online outlets, in their own newspapers, their own TV stations. They set up their white media propaganda outlets. Then they put some empty-headed Negro who they pay to say this garbage. And then they turn around and point to the very person who they put on television. And they cite him as a source. They manufacture their own Negro sources. Now they tried that with that Cruz character. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to say Coleman Hughes, though Cruz is his actual name. They tried that with him on that Capitol Hill farce. And that fell flat. Because he was sitting here, all that garbage about, well, we're going to try to soft pedal it. Let's see if we can talk around reparations by saying it doesn't have to be a check. It doesn't. I mean, there's lots of lots of things can qualify as reparations. When we shot that down, then they just said, Jonathan Capehart, God dang it. Having some lukewarm, mamby-pamby, clearly right of center Democrat like Coleman Hughes. Who, by the way, is not foundational black. Holman Hughes' ancestry does not go back to the killing fields of the American South. His ancestry is not going back to those plantations. His ancestry goes to Puerto Rico. So when he speaks about reparations in America, he's talking about something that doesn't actually have anything to do with him. But that was the entire reason for putting him up there, precisely because it has nothing to do with him. He has no problem saying reparations are not necessary because he wouldn't get anything out of it. Nor should he get anything out of it. The cravenly, the cowardly, the complicitous with white supremacy are not supposed to get anything. And neither should a Jonathan Capehart. Now this guy, he went on Twitter and he made it a point. He knew that that article that he wrote was a pack of lies. He's attacking reparations and saying black people don't need a check. What they need is an apology. He would never, ever go to Jews and say Jews don't need to have any sort of reparations for the Holocaust. Why, what Jews need is an apology from the German government. That's all you need because no amount of money is going to make up for the German government apologizing. He would never go to the Jews and say that. 
And with this LGBT reparations bill that got that apparently resolution rather that got approved by the House of Representatives, you better believe Jonathan Capehart, who himself is homosexual. He's not going to go to his fellow gays and say, you know, we don't need reparations for any of the gay people who were not able to be able to inherit their common law spouses belongings or their holdings. You know, we don't need reparations for any sort of economic disadvantage or for any difficulties the law may have given us in holding on to the financial assets of gay partners or, or what have you. He's not going to go up to them and say, he's not going to go up to his fellow gays and say, we don't need a check. What we need is an apology. Nothing will take the place of an apology. Notice how he didn't write that article. Jonathan Capehart didn't write the article saying that no check of any amount substitutes for an apology. He didn't tell gay people, we don't need a check. We need an apology. He didn't say that to them. That wasn't the article that he wrote. But when it comes time to talk to foundational blacks, when it comes time to talk to the survivors of the plantations in America, all of a sudden, Jonathan Capehart saying, we don't need a check. What we actually need is an apology. We need, we need white people to see how we, to see how much we hurt. And we need white people to show some remorse, show some remorse. And that's good enough. Now, this was obviously meant to be spitting in our faces. This was meant to be a swipe at us. This was meant to be a slap in the face to foundational blacks to point and say, yeah, we hear what you guys are saying. And we're going to blatantly say that there will be no overturning of the a racial order in America, which is the economic order in America. America's racism, white supremacy is based on the strength of its economy, resources. And black people, well, we've already decided that black people are to be shut out from any and all resources. And Jonathan Capehart's going on the record saying, yeah, and I stand for that. I'm a loyal soldier for white supremacy is what Jonathan Capehart was declaring. Oh, that gap, the wealth gap between blacks and whites, Jonathan Capehart was declaring, yes, I'm here to make sure that it is enforced and that it never changes. And I will tell any lie that white supremacy wants me to tell in order to maintain it. So he goes to Twitter and he knew exactly what the response would be. Everybody knows that if you're going to call yourself attacking reparations, he knew exactly what the response was. And that gave him the opening when black people were completely and thoroughly justifiably outraged at the vomitous, disgusting, putrid, perverted thing that he did in print. Rather, he then got to do what white power really wanted him to do. And that was he got to call the ADOS movement illiterates. He got to take a direct swipe at them. He got to attack them directly which is what the entire point of this little putrid exercise actually was. This was to set up an opportunity for him to have entree to mention ADOS. He didn't mention it in his so-called article. Okay, so he didn't know who ADOS was this week when he wrote that pack of lies. And apparently he's never heard of ADOS before. Oh, but when it came time for him to actually defend his lies, now all of a sudden he could attack ADOS directly. He could attack that movement directly, and that's what it was set up to do. It was set up to give him an opportunity to show white supremacy. Yeah, we're taking aim at you guys. We know exactly who you guys are, and we want you to know that we've got you in the crosshairs. We want you to know that we're mounting a media assault against tangibles. And I told you that that's what this is all about. When YouTube decided it, was t it would take down my CNN video, which, by the way, thanks to the B1 Brigadiers, you guys forced the bastards to put it back up. What happened was they don't want black people understanding that the white media is mounting an offensive against us. What CNN's doing, what Jonathan Capehart has been doing, what Jay-Z's been doing, this is part of it. This is the we're going to put this black empowerment genie back in the bottle. All of this troublemaking that all of these former slaves have been doing, we're going to undo it. And they're going to get a bunch of black bootlicks, a bunch of black puppets to do it. That's what they don't want black people to see. This is going to be a nonstop barrage, the likes of which we have never seen. White supremacy requires black front flunkies to get out in front in order to sell the lies, to push the lies. You just saw Jay-Z declare when he thought that nobody was listening, when no one could hear him. 
We're going to get stuck on Colin Kaepernick or we're going to move on to get me some money. And now you've had Jonathan Capehart, who has never had anything complimentary to say when it comes to foundational blacks. Now he's coming flat out. And after years, if not decades of pretending that he was somehow some sort of liberal, some sort of leftist. Oh, he's a black person speaking for black folks interests. Now the most important thing to black folks getting that check. He comes out and says, we don't need a check. We need an apology. An apology is what we need. And then when black people call him on it, he goes, you guys are a bunch of illiterates. Because that's what he really was saying. He did not say, you know what? Uh, at the very least, you would expect that this chucklehead would say, well, maybe I didn't state that as artfully as I could. Well, you know, there's obviously I left out some stuff. He didn't say that. Instead, what he said was what he was wanting to say. Look at these illiterates. I'm looking at them as if they're just the craziest people in the world. Yeah, white power is using their black power puppets in order to attack us left, right, and center, and this is just the beginning. This is so obviously a white media stunt that is part of a larger agenda. For the, I mean, the damned insult for him to say that no check could be a substitute for an apology. Yeah, because if white folks give you an apology, why, that's good as gold now, isn't it? That's what he's really saying. Well, black people, doesn't an apology, doesn't a pat on the head from white folks, doesn't that mean more to you than a check? You got black folks saying, no, nah, to hell with your apology. Keep that. I can't put your apology in my bank account. In other words, black people are getting serious, requiring things that would obligate white supremacy to give up its power. And white supremacy's power is based on the strength of its economy. What Capehart said, it sounded exactly like the kind of crap that you hear from these right-wing nuts. Well, you know, black folks don't need a check. They need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. This from a group who has never done anything by their bootstraps, by the way. The group who received the most giveaways, goodies, and guarantees and continue to receive all sorts of free swag from white supremacy. They get handed every crumb of their daily bread, constantly being handed everything... And yet they got the nerve to turn around to the people who have financed their lifestyles to which they become accustomed. And then these right wing nuts, these white supremacists on the right have the nerve to say, well, black people want something given to them. Nope. We just want the exact same treatment that a Newt Gingrich gets, that a Donald Trump gets. And we will have it because without us, there wouldn't be a Newt Gingrich or a Donald Trump. So now you have Jonathan Capehart, so-called leftist, and a number of leftists, by the way, not just him, but you have a whole bunch of these folk on the left who are now sounding exactly like Rush Limbaugh or False News, I mean Fox News, showing that when it comes to black people, there is no such thing as right wing or left wing. When it comes to black people, there's no such thing as conservative or liberal. It is literally as simple as black and white. Your white leftists and their black counterparts who like to try to talk like them, you go ahead and bring up anything that changes the lopsided economic imbalance that's been against us for so long, how the playing field's been totally tilted against us, you go ahead and start talking about balancing that, doing some serious stuff that's going to empower us, then all of a sudden, the white left starts sounding exactly like the white right. That's because until now, there's been no substantive pressure put on them. But now the pressure is being applied and everyone's being forced. White supremacy is being forced to have to bring out their puppets and say, you got to get out there with they're exposing themselves. This is what we meant to do. We want to see everyone who's against us. We want to be able to see all of the fakers, frauds, phonies, and flunkies who have been arrayed against us. We intend to make everybody go on the record. Everyone's going to have to declare where they stand. Do you stand on the side of justice? Do you stand on the side of black empowerment? Or do you stand on the side of white supremacy? There is no middle ground. Capehart trying to talk about nuance. There is no nuance between justice and white supremacy. There is no nuance between freedom and slavery. There is no nuance between right and wrong. There is no nuance between perversion and morality. There is one or the other, and there is no road in between. You don't get to play the game of, oh, well, there was nuance here. No, he said exactly what he meant, exactly the way that he said it. Because he has never done this regarding any other group. When it comes to black folks, all of a sudden, no, I, I got to speak out. You don't need a check. You need an apology. 
You need an apology is what you need. Uh, a white apology is better than gold. Capehart's article was so ridiculous, it was meant to be. It was so blatantly insulting and clearly condescending that you don't even see white leftists trying to defend it. Where are the white people on the left? Where are the white liberals who are saying, well, Jonathan Capehart's got a point? No, they understand exactly what the point is. Just like Marion Williamson understands. Just like Tulsi Gabbard understands. Just like Elizabeth Warren understands. Just like Bernie the Bigot Sanders and Joe Biden. You see what's going on here. You would think that simply as statistical, as a matter of statistical error, you would think that there would be a couple of white folks on the left who would be saying, hey, this whole reparations thing, yeah, black folks need a check. You would think that just simply as a matter of, just a matter of law of averages, there would be a few of them who would be banging the drum for that, but not one of them is doing that. And that's and the reason why is you're not going to be getting on white media owned airwaves or websites unless you've taken that pledge unless they already know that you will never say anything like that and just in case you're somebody who might have those kind of leanings who might actually lean in the direction of justice you're going to have editors producers showrunners and hosts who will let you know these these are things you better not say unless you want this to be the last time you're on this show and that's where jonathan capehart comes in he gets a good amount of his income from from those little bits of speaking fees that these networks give you. Whenever you appear on their show, they give you a little bit of money. And he wants to make sure that those butter biscuits keep rolling in. But this is not to say that his little stunt didn't serve a purpose. I've been warning you about this. That the white media would begin a deluge just this flood of trotting out every safe Negro who they've ever had on the air, and they would all be singing a nonstop chorus of reparations shouldn't be a check. Now forget about that. He's gone beyond saying reparations shouldn't be a check to reparations must not be a check. It cannot be a check. An apology, uh, just empty hot air from the mouth of a white supremacist. That would be reparations. And the fact that this is coming from the Washington Post the paper of record inside the beltway, this puts, this is white supremacy. This is official white power, a mouthpiece for white power, not merely because they happen to be a prestigious white supremacist outlet, but because of the fact that Jeff Bezos owns it. Jeff Bezos is like the freaking richest man on the planet now. So you better believe the Washington Post speaks for both the political and economic establishment of white supremacy. They are the official mouthpiece for white supremacy in the raw. And what does Jeff Bezos use the Washington Post to do? He uses it to push a lie, to push a so-called article that puts aside all pretense and just goes straight forward. This is the situation we put white supremacy in. They have now had to stop pretending as if they were going to talk around the issue. They've had to come straight up the middle. This is the kind of pressure that we've put the bastards under. White supremacy now has no choice but to come flat out and say it. And they're going to use Negroes as their means of doing it. Because hopefully, as far as they're concerned, well, if we get a black person to say it, then that gives us political cover. If we get Jay-Z to say that the NFL is doing all right and, well, there's bigger fish to fry. And we got to move beyond Colin Kaepernick. Well, we didn't say it. Jay-Z said it. And if we get Jonathan Capehart to say that reparations cannot be a check, it shouldn't be a check, we don't need a check, a check would be wrong. Well, we didn't say it, Jonathan Capehart said it, and Coleman Hughes said it. You can't say that we said, why, we're just doing what the black community wants. Well, what's the black community? These hand-picked Negroes who we have on the payroll. This handful of cherry-picked black flunkies who we've got under our heel. These suck-ups who we got on a leash, they're the black community. And what about the tens of millions who are in the streets and in your face? Well, that's just a fringe. That's that's a fringe, buddy. That's just a bunch of outliers. Uh, you know, the black community doesn't really know what's in their interest, you know. Well, who does? Jonathan Capehart does. Oh, yeah, he knows exactly what's in black people's interest. That's the game that they're trying. And they figure that if they trot out enough of these clowns long enough, and if they have the white media who makes them prominent and make sure that everybody is just carpet bombed with Jay-Z defending the NFL and Jonathan Cape Hart objecting to reparations, even in principle, he objects to reparations, not merely in fact, but in principle. If you have these Negroes who previously were supposed to be the reasonable Negroes, these were the safe Negroes. 
if you have them saying it, well, now that gives cover to the George Wills and it gives cover to the Joe Scarboroughs and it gives cover to the Chris Matthews and it gives cover to every other white supremacist, official white supremacist in media. Now these clowns who have never had anything good to say about us, now they can say, well, you know, reparations, that whole uh, check, that that's just unreasonable, you know. We've had, why we've got our guest in the studio, Jonathan Capehart, he's going to explain to us why nothing would be the right thing for reparations. But reparations should be nothing at all, because that's reasonable. Capehart's tried to, to palm himself off as a liberal, but when it comes to tangibles, he doesn't sound any different than David Duke. But then again, what other choice does he have? He has, this is what he's always believed about the black community. So for those of you out there who ever gave a wink and a nod to him, have you ever noticed that similarity between Jonathan Capehart and D. Ray McKeeson and Coleman Hughes? You notice a similarity, by the way. I'm sure that that's how he justifies his opposition to reparations. I'm sure that he has a lot of anger that he has toward the black community. I'm sure he's got a lot of anger based, by the way, on falsehoods. But financially, he knows that this is the only play that he has financially. He's going to ingratiate himself to the white powers that be at our expense. He can't afford to lose the white media's favor. All these Negroes on TV and in print, they saw what happened in the last few years when the white media began purging all of their black bootlicks, practically all of them. They saw what happened to Roly Poly Martin. They saw what happened to Big Bird. They saw what happened to Goldie Taylor. She's been MIA. And the only time that anyone mentions Melissa Harris Lacewell, who gives a damn, is to mock her. They saw what happened to him. White power made examples out of those Negroes. Capehart wants to remain in white power's good graces. He doesn't have a plan B. So when he sees white power being threatened, he's got to jump in there. He's got to jump in with both feet. And one of the things, because Jonathan Capehart has made it a point, he's part of this group of liars who tries to push this line that the black community doesn't support the LGBT movement and as a gay black man, I've got a problem with that. He pushes that lie. Oh, the black community is homophobic. He likes to push that lie. He likes to say the black community is the heart of homophobia. They, I'm sure that in his mind, that's how he justifies attacking the black community. Well, the black community is homophobic. So I'm going to I'm gonna rattle my saber at you and I'm going to let you guys know this is payback for your homophobia. That's what Jonathan Capehart thinks he's doing. That's what's going through his otherwise empty head. As with so many other things, he's got it exactly backwards. It's the LGBT movement that hasn't supported reparations. That's the problem. The black community has not been attacking the LGBT community, but when you look at people like Milo Snuffleupagus, when you look at people like Ed Buck, when you look at a number of these clowns, both on the right and on the left, these guys have been attacking the black community left, right, and center, but Jonathan Capehart's got nothing to say about that. You haven't seen ACT UP or GLAAD or any other LGBT organization fighting against police brutality and white supremacy. In fact, you've seen a number of them who have been proud spokespeople for white supremacy. Milo Snuffleupagus had been a shameless, shameless proponent of white supremacy. But you didn't see Jonathan Capehart writing any articles about that. So he knew what he was doing. And that finally brings us to the last member of this iron triangle of black flunkies, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. She's been total radio silence when it comes to the ADOS movement. You've never heard her say it, never heard her write it. Never heard her comment on it. She ain't had a dang thing to say. As far as she's concerned, ADOS doesn't even exist. Now, she didn't really have anything to say as far as Jonathan Capehart's article went, but when he decided to attack the ADOS movement, all of a sudden, Sheila Jackson Lee, who had never even acknowledged that the movement exists, who ain't has said nothing about it, who has treated it as, as, as if it was a non-entity, had, ain't had one dang word to say. All of a sudden, she comes out of hiding. She breaks radio silence so she can retweet what he said. 
you attack the ADOS movement and all of a sudden Sheila Jackson Lee figures out where her Twitter fingers went to. Now, who knows, maybe she was triggered by the fact that Capehart used a gif of Rihanna rolling her eyes. Maybe that was what it was. Um, Sheila Jackson Lee is an Islander. She's descended from Islanders, just like Rihanna is. They're both, they both trace their roots not back to the killing fields of the American South, but to the islands of the Caribbean. So as fellow, so as fellow Islanders, I think that that's probably what got her attention. Rihanna is not a foundational black, and neither is Sheila Jackson Lee. Neither one of them traced their ancestry back to the American plantations. So Capehart spreads his lie that black people want an apology and nothing else. That all black people need is an apology, which is nothing more than his way of saying, you niggers need to sit, you just need to sit down. Yeah, I guess that perhaps Capehart's live in his lifestyle partner, who is white, by the way. I guess perhaps that guy's giving him a hard time about it. He's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta go hard in the paint for white supremacy on this one. And when Black Twitter drags his behind, he lashes out like a jealous girlfriend at the ADOS movement. And what a surprise! Sheila Jackson Lee slithers out of her hole to back him up on it. She sees him attack the ADOS movement, and she co-signs it. These events are not mutually exclusive, family. Because she damn sure never retweeted anything that I or the other new voices of black media have ever said. She has completely ignored the black empowerment movement, completely ignored the new voices of black media. While the ADOS movement was not the only reason reparations has become a hot button issue recently, the ADOS movement was certainly key in making reparations a specific, prominent issue by pushing it in the white media. But notice that Sheila Jackson Lee never reached out to the ADOS movement. I certainly noticed that. She's never reached out to black media, never reached out to the ADOS movement. What, who the hell does she reach out to? She reaches out to Joy Reid. She reaches out to Jonathan Capehart. Not because they're saying anything that's profound or insightful, but because of who they're attacking. Some would say that maybe she didn't know about the ADOS movement. That's bullcrap. As much time as she spends tweeting and retweeting, look at her freaking Twitter timeline. Was a, it, no, no wonder she hasn't made much progress on pushing HR 40. She spends damn near every waking moment on Twitter. Between her and Donald Trump, I can see why Twitter's a billion dollar company. That's what Sheila Jackson Lee spends her time. Do look at you look at her Twitter timeline. It's a damn near uninterrupted litany of just tweet, retweet. I mean, every minute of every day of her pathetic life is accounted for on Twitter. You can trace exactly what the hell she's doing because she's on Twitter. And only a moron would actually try to pretend that she didn't know about the very group who had done the most to get reparations and HR 40 in specific mentioned in a number of prominent online news sites. She owed that little farce hearing that she got to pretend like she was a somebody at. She owed that entire hearing to the ADOS movement. And her retweeting an attack on ADOS for no other reason than that it was an attack on ADOS? Capehart didn't say anything about his article. He didn't try to defend any part of it. He didn't try to add anything. All he did was he said, look at me looking at the ADOS crowd reacting to a nuanced piece they didn't bother to read. No, they read it. And so does Sheila Jackson Lee. So when you attack the ADOS movement, all of a sudden Sheila Jackson Lee, she'll give you a thumbs up. She'll try to spread the word on that. She ain't spreading the word on anything that the ADOS movement is trying to do as far as publicizing the push for reparations. She ain't retweeting that. Oh, but if you attack the ADOS movement, she will retweet that, though. She knows exactly who ADOS is. ADOS pointed out that Congresswoman Lee is not descended from America's slaves. Yeah, at some point there was going to have to be a moment of reckoning on that little factoid because this was an internal contradiction that at some point was going to have to be faced up to. Now, they didn't attack Sheila Jackson Lee. They simply made a point of fact. 
Because some of them even went so far as to point out that when reparations becomes reality, no, Sheila Jackson Lee would not qualify. Because there is a standard for what would constitute someone who would deserve reparations for American slavery. You got to be able to trace your bloodline back to America's plantations. If you're tracing it back to plantations in Jamaica, if you're tracing it back to sugar plantations in Jamaica or something, that's in Jamaica. You need to be taking that up with the British government. But Sheila Jackson Lee understood that. And as soon as, as soon as that distinction was made, as soon as somebody brought up that point, Sheila Jackson Lee's thinking, heck, I've been eating off of the sons and daughters of American slavery all this time. I've been kind of palming myself off as if my ancestry is traced back to America's plantations when it's not. And, you know, it took me to Congress and it's taken me around the world and it's it's made it where I get to brag and I get myself a federal pension and uh, I get free health care and all the rest of it by off of this. Well, why should it stop now? Um, if you guys are getting paid, I'm supposed to get paid, too. You know, that's her mentality. But, you know, the moment of reckoning on this was inevitable because it needed to be said. So long as people tiptoed around the fundamental contradiction of not mentioning that, hey, the very woman who's pushing H.R. 40, she's part of that cherry pit class of black immigrants who white supremacy elevated, just like Barack Obama, just like Rihanna. So truth of the matter is, while it's nice that she's saying something about reparations, long as we understand, it just needs to be said. We cannot push forward. We cannot push a virtuous movement by trying to give a wink and a nod and silent complicity to lies. We have to be truthful about it. And the truth is, yeah, reparations for America's slaves would not include Sheila Jackson Lee. But the truth of the matter is, since every crumb of her daily bread is owed to the struggle of America's slaves, she would not be a congresswoman either without us pushing for black people to be elected officials in this country. Without our struggles to change the political landscape of this country, she would not be where she is in any shape, form, or fashion. And without that foundational black voter base, without the sons and daughters of America's plantations voting for her because there ain't enough Jamaicans to do it, Without us supporting her, she wouldn't have anything. She wouldn't have any political office at all. So she owes everything to us. It's not as if she's been left with her behind out in the wind, just pockets turned out. She's gotten wealthy. This woman has gotten money. She's gotten prominent. She's gotten a whole lot of influence because of us. So if anything, she should be looking at this as an opportunity for her to give back to the group that gave her everything. Sheila Jackson Lee owes everything to us. We owe nothing to her. This would be an opportunity for her to say, hey, I recognize that I wouldn't be where I am without this specific, unique group of African-Americans. And that being the case, I owe it to them to do everything that I can to get them what they're supposed to have. I owe everything to them, and this is my opportunity to give back. But that's not what she's done. Instead, as far as she's concerned, well, you were never actually supposed to push on this reparations thing. It was supposed to be kind of an empty conversation that goes around and around in circles and never actually produces anything. See, that's the dirty truth of what John Conyers and now Sheila Jackson Lee have been doing with this H.R. 40 thing. It was never actually, the dirty truth is it was never actually supposed to go anywhere. It was supposed to be just one of those pointless things that gets mentioned so that black people, especially so-called black intelligentsia, some of these Negroes who think themselves clever, who want to pretend to be some sort of black academics, they can go ahead and point to it and say, well, John Conyers has been pushing H.R. 40, has been languishing in the Congress for 30 years, and Sheila Jackson Lee is now trying to represent it. She is now sponsoring it, and that's supposed to be what it was. It was supposed to be a talking point. An empty talking point. Reparations matters to us, but it doesn't matter to Sheila Jackson Lee. Not really. It only mattered to her to the extent that she thought that she could get something out of it. Now, when she thought that, hey, if, if they ever start cutting checks, I'm going to be first in line with my hand out. You know, <laughs> you got you to gotta put something in my hand. That's what she was thinking. She owes her entire life, everything that she has ever had, everything she's ever enjoyed from her political position to whatever finances she has, everything she's got, she owes to the black people who came out of slavery. But these are the very people who she makes sure to keep at arm's length. She goes on Joy Reid's show 
after Joy Reid spent weeks in a back and forth on Twitter, Joy Reid spent weeks attacking the ADOS movement and aligning it and going into a feud with several of its members and trying to compare the ADOS movement to the alt-right, which she was uh, in a moment of intemperance, which she actually for Joy Reid, she doesn't have a moment of intemperance. She lives every waking moment intemperate. But she got triggered and she let slip exactly what the white media template was going to be. The ADOS movement is no different than the alt-right. This is just a bunch of black Nazis. Yeah, so if you start pushing that black people get what we're supposed to have, if you start pushing for justice for slavery, if you start demanding that America be held accountable for the greatest crime in human history, why, you're no different than those Nazis in Charlottesville. See, that's what they always do to any black people who actually push for what we're supposed to have. Marcus Garvey, well, he was a radical. He was no different than the Klan. Malcolm X, no different than the Klan, you know. Black Panthers, no different than the Klan, you know. The Nation of Islam, no different than the Klan, you know. That's the template. That's the template. That's the talking point. Any black folks who actually push substantively and aggressively for what black folks are supposed to have, you're no different than the Klan. You're no different than these right-wing white supremacists. Yeah, except the difference is you got people in Congress who make sure the Klan gets tangibles. They make sure that the Klan and every other white supremacist group is protected by law enforcement. And they make sure that all of these black radicals are attacked and singled out by law enforcement. See Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, the third, he made sure that he publicized there's these black identity extremists out there and these guys are a growing threat to America. What does that mean? They're threatening white supremacy. Well, what about the alt-right? Well, they're very fine people. Ain't that what Donald Trump said? Very fine people. Yeah, that's what's going on here. And you have Jonathan Capehart. Joy Reid and Sheila Jackson Lee in an unholy alliance to push that lie, to try to find a way to define those who are proponents of reparations, real proponents, not phony baloney ones like Big Bird. So when Sheila Jackson Lee went on Joy Reid's show, she did it to make a statement. She did it to make a point. She knew damn well that the only thing that Joy Reid had been saying about reparations was that black people shouldn't get them. And that the ADOS movement was some sort of black analog when she wasn't claiming that it was Russian bots. Let's not forget about that, by the way. She dropped that lie, so I, so it kind of falls into the background. But at first, when she was pushing the lie that these are just a bunch of Russian bots, Russian bots. But before she started saying Russian bots, before she said Russian bots, she had spent weeks saying that these are a bunch of black people following some blood and soil uh, mentality. Yeah, blood and soil. Bring up some good old Nazi slogans and then say that black people are apparently nothing but a bunch of Nazis. That's a perennial lie that the white left loves to drag out. Black people are homophobic. When black people assert themselves, they're no different than Nazis. They never do that with anybody else, but they only do that with us. So when Sheila Jackson Lee finally decided that she was going to break her silence on reparations and go on Joy Reid's show opposite Big Bird, she did that to make a point. We are all in agreement. We are all in lockstep. We are all united against reparations. That's what she made it clear. That's what she did. She wanted to give her formal affairs official allegiance to white supremacy all of you folk out there who've been thinking that sheila jackson lee it was just a matter of if we can just get her attention you were the only ones who had her attention she was terrified to say anything but when white power said well you got to do something well as long as i don't have to actually directly engage you won't have to we just need you to go ahead and uh, give, go ahead and speak friendly with Big Bird while you guys declare that there's only one legitimate reparations movement. It's going to be a bunch of old gray beards who ain't done a damn thing and ain't pushed the ball down the field even one inch. Sheila Jackson Lee categorically ignored the ADOS movement up until now because she wanted to make it clear to her white masters, her true constituency, that she isn't serious about reparations, just in case they were thinking, uh, you know, Sheila, are you getting a little bit uh, squirrely on us? Uh, you're not getting wobbly on us, are you? You're not starting to think that maybe reparations should happen. No, 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 absolutely not, massa. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put them in their place. 
She wanted to make it crystal clear that she isn't about to acknowledge or say anything in support of black people who actually are pushing for reparations. But with this latest stunt, the damn nerve of this woman to retweet an attack, an insult, a swipe at a group of people who are simply making the point that the sons and daughters of America's slaves have been left out for her to do that. That is beyond redemption. Now, I've never had anything to say about Sheila Jackson Lee because I've always known where she stood. A number of things. I have no respect for any of the congressional black talkers. I did a video, which, by the way, I will be reposting about how the Congressional Black Caucus does not represent foundational blacks. They represent immigrants. They represent LGBT. They represent everything except for us. There is no Congressional Black Caucus. There's just the Congressional Black Talkers. So who are the representatives of the sons and daughters of America's slaves? The new voices of black media. That's who. But Sheila Jackson Lee understands that now that we are firmly defining that we are going to get ours, we're also making it clear that we're not supporting anyone who stands against our interests. If you're going to try to keep us in a deprived state, try to keep us completely and thoroughly impoverished, we're not supporting that. And with Sheila Jackson Lee, she can look down the field and say, man, it's only a matter of time before somebody points out, hey, Sheila Jackson Lee ain't done a damn thing for America's slaves, for the former slaves. She ain't done a damn thing. She's been fighting against our interests. Time to get her out the paint. Time for her to be sent packing back to private life. Time to get her out of Washington. She understands that so far as she's concerned, she may not be able to stop us sweeping her from office, but she can go ahead and give the middle finger, which is what this was. She knows exactly where this is leading to. What's happening is that foundational blacks are making out a list. We're making out a list of those who support us and we're making out a list of those who have always been against us. The ones who have been for us will get our support and the ones who have been against us are going to get voted out of office. And she knows that she's on the list of those who will not be long for inside the beltway. So she better go ahead and find some lobbying firm. She better go ahead and find some consulting gig that she can get because uh, she's not going to be an honorable representative from Texas for too much longer if the new voices of black media have anything to say about it. She knows this. She knows exactly what's happening. And I want to be the first to get this out there. She has now come out and done what I was waiting for her to do. She's now finally spoken when it comes to the real reparations movement. She's finally spoken. And now what we're going to declare is Sheila Jackson Lee must be removed from office. Her black voter support is going to have to make sure that they get her out of there. We have to make sure that Sheila Jackson Lee has made an example of what happens when you fight against our interests. When you decide that you're going to attack us, we're going to make a political example out of her. She's going to be sent packing out of Washington so fast, make her head spin. We made an example out of Kamala Harris, and now we're going to make an example out of Sheila Jackson Lee. And look, people can say what they want about the ADOS movement, but what you also have to say is that it's serious about making white power come off of what they stole from us. It's serious about leveling the resource gap. And the movement's also made it clear that the Democrats are not going to be able to fool anyone with their empty, do-nothing, one-size-fits-all policies. Well, we've come up with a new bill that everyone will be able to apply for. No, it has to be specifically, specifically for us because you cannot level a playing field that has been so lopsided against us unless you put disproportionate weight on our side. Trying to put something in the middle, that simply maintains the status quo. We're going to change the status quo. See, what you got to understand is that when you talk about these black folks who have gone into government service, whether they be black judges or whether they be black mayors or, or in the case of Sheila Jackson Lee, black members of the, of the federal legislature, these guys raise their hand and take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, the same Constitution that says the black people are three-fifths human, the same Constitution which to this day still promotes and protects the practice of slavery, only now instead of it being a private sector institution, it is now a public sector institution. Old Sam Smith with his plantation, he can't own black people, but Uncle Sam can. And does. Sheila Jackson Lee took an oath 
to protect and preserve and defend this practice. This is what you need to know about your black representatives. They raised their hand and they took an oath to protect white supremacy. So you are not going to have these Negroes who have given their allegiance to white supremacy, then turning around and say, oh, I got to destroy it too." forget as far as they're concerned. They're on the inside now as they see it. They're on the team now as they see it. Jay-Z is not about to tell Warren Buffett, you know, Warren, you've been really acting against the interests of black people. And, you know, it's, it's time you got put in your place. And I know that you've been backing all these politicians. They've been putting these racist laws on the books. And you've been backing these racist sheriffs who have been covering up the murders of black people and executing black people in the streets. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get you out the paint. I don't care how much money you got. I'm going to make my next track about you. And I'm going to take this money that I got. I'm going to start feeling some candidates to push back against the racists who you've been backing in office. And I'm going to try to educate black people to the extent that I can. I'm going to try to raise the issue of these laws that you've been using, the practices you've been using, all this stuff, you, your business practices that steamroll black neighborhoods and dumping toxic waste in black neighborhoods. We're going we're gonna to make sure that everybody knows about it. Jay-Z didn't do that. He's not about to do that. As far as he's concerned, he could give less than a damn about Brooklyn. He's much more interested in Martha's Vineyard. That's what Jay-Z's about. Jay-Z's going for self. Jonathan Capehart, he's not about to confront GLAD or act up on their hostility toward black Americans. He's not about to do that. But what he will do is he will attack black people simply for demanding justice for the greatest crime in human history. Sheila Jackson Lee, she's not about to say thank you to the sons and daughters of America's slavery for everything that we've done for her. But what she will do is she will retweet and support an attack against us. That she will do. You see, what's happening now, what is being promoted, all of this black empowerment that is forcing its way onto the national stage, forcing its way into the mouths of all of these flunkies for white supremacy, this is the single most substantive threat that white supremacy has faced in 500 plus years. This is the greatest threat that they're facing. Now, they're trying to put a brave front up. They're trying to put a pretty face on it, pretend like, hey, what, us worry? That's what they're trying to do right now. But when you see this torrent that they're setting up, the coming flood and the already begun steady stream of black flunkies who white supremacy is paying in order to attack us, what you understand is they're very worried about this. They should be. They've heard what we've been saying and they tried to ignore us. Remember what I said before about their enemies who it's best to fight and enemies who it's best to ignore and enemies who it's best to contain? Well, they tried to ignore us. They spent almost a decade trying to ignore us. And they see what happened. You got brothers like Jason Black and Tariq who have already made it clear that when it comes to the media sphere, black folks are going to be getting their information from black men. That's where they're going to be getting their information from. They're going to be getting their information from black brothers who they know and can trust. This is a this is an existential threat to those safe Negroes on cable TV. They understand that, that there is a growing black media ecosystem and that black people are turning away from these white outlets and turning to the black ones. So they try to ignore us and they see that that ain't going to work. So now what they're trying to do is they're trying to contain us now. And they're trying to carry out that containment through a bunch of black flunkies and black front groups. That's what Big Bird and his N Cobra and the N, by the way, stands for nothing. That's what they're about. That's containment. If you're not able to stop these black radicals, then what you do is you try to get some mealy mouth flunky puppets and try to get, they'll use a little bit of the black radical verbiage. And they'll try to kind of talk like them. And hopefully we'll, we'll have them on MSNBC so that they're very prominent. So that they can be seen by as many black people as possible. And we're going to give them a lot of ink. And we're going to make sure that we don't say anything critical about these guys. These are our trusted hand-picked. These are our homegrown black radicals. These are our homegrown black activists. So we're not going to be delegitimizing them by attacking them. In fact, they will not be criticized at all. D. Ray McKeeson will be brought on Stephen Colbert. They'll have him on, They'll have the fool at Harvard. They're not going to be attacking him. They're not going to be calling him any sort of Nazi. There won't be any blood and soil comparisons coming against him from Joy Reid. They make sure not to do that. They know who their flunky puppets are. 
So that's the goal. We're going to go ahead and have, we're going to have Big Bird go on Joy Reid's show. And we're going to make sure that people understand this is the legitimate reparations movement. What's so legitimate about them? They don't do anything. They don't produce anything. That makes them legitimate. And they're going to try to make sure that they have some black Negroes who they bring to Congress. Oh, look at this. These guys are testifying before Congress. Don't you feel as if this is important? I don't give a damn if they never go before Congress. This ain't about having some sort of winning the news cycle. This is not about whether or not black people sit in front of Congress. The question is whether or not Congress will do what black people say. You don't need to have a congressional hearing. You already know what black people want. Last time I checked, the NRA hasn't had to go before Congress more than a couple of times ever, and yet they get what they want all the time. The 1% who run America, they never have to go sit in front of Congress. They get what they want without a single congressional hearing. Ain't got to have no hearings at all. Ain't Ain't got to talk about nothing. They just get what they want as a matter of course. So no, you don't impress me by bringing Danny Glover and Ta-Nehisi Coates and bringing some other do-nothing nobodies to sit there and pretend like they're speaking for me. I speak for me. Not the white media's hand-picked puppets. White supremacy built their economy off of our labor. And they use that wealth to create a society that has institutionalized black poverty and attacks black group economics for over 150 years. And they have used the wealth that we created in order to manufacture a propaganda arm, a white media that pushes the false narrative that black people are making it. And what's their proof that black people are making it? It is an increasingly shrinking number of black so-called professionals and black so-called entertainers and a small handful of foreign-born blacks who are put in government or corporate positions, the Sheila Jackson Lees, the Rihannas, the Jay-Zs, the Barack Obamas. The numbers are getting smaller and smaller, by the way. The examples of so-called black success are starting to dry up, and that's fine. What's going to happen is they will start beating the drum even harder. The one or two Negroes who still have a couple of pennies in their pocket, like Jay-Z, you know, he's like the one Negro in hip-hop who's actually got the kind of money that he allegedly has. So guess what? He's going to be on all the covers. Well, ain't you gonna, aren't you going to show us a few more of these rappers? Seems to me like rap music is the, is the way to go, right? Nah, it's just going to be Jay-Z. Just going to be him. That's it. This is the fraud that they've pushed, and now somebody is exposing the lie. Barack Obama's success, and Rihanna's success, and Sheila Jackson Lee's success, this has been no victory for black America. It's been exactly the opposite. It's been a victory for the propaganda arm of white supremacy, for the white media. It's been a means of getting black people to become a hyper-aspirational people, completely and thoroughly vicarious. We live our success through articles about Jay-Z and Beyonce. We're not trying to live it in the real world. We're trying to live it in our imaginations. Jay-Z's success somehow is ours. Somehow. And the white media has made sure that they bring on their black flunkies. They bring on black so-called journalists and bring on black so-called academics to say black people are making it. We're making progress. Oh, there's been a lot of growth. Oh, there's been a lot of headway made. Black people are black people are represented here and, and black people are making strides. And they write one lying article after the next one lying news set so-called news segment after the next. All of it with the exact same lie. Oh, well, black people are making progress. Oh, sure, the things are not perfect, but they're better than they were in the past, and that's their favorite lie. They've been repeating that one since 1619. In 2019, they say, well, things aren't perfect now, but it's better than it was in the 80s when Reagan was president. When Reagan was president, they say, well, it's better than it was in the 60s when black folks were having fire hoses turned on. In the 60s, they say, well, it's better than it was in the 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, and 19 teens when they were lynching black folks like so many Christmas ornaments. And then in the 20s, 30s, they say, well, it's better than it was after after the end of, of Reconstruction, when the Klan was running around burning down entire black townships during Reconstruction, they say, well, it's better than it was during slavery. And during slavery, they say, well, you're better off than you were in Africa. That's the lie they've been telling for hundreds of years now. And black folks keep going for it. 
So they show you a couple of well-to-do Negroes who white supremacy put some money in the pockets of and tell you, this is your success. This is proof that black people are making it. And what they were scared of is that black people would rebel against these lies, against this white supremacist media programming. And that's what the new voices of black media have done. We've aggregated your numbers and helped to make you understand. Do not ever let them get away with these lies. Do not ever let them get away with lying about our condition. Do not ever let them get away with saying that black people are making it while they're cutting us off at the knees. Do not ever let them do that. We are the only ones who get to speak on our condition. If we say that we're doing well, then and only then are we doing well. But Jonathan Capehart can't say it. Sheila Jackson Lee can't say it. Jay-Z damn sure can't say it. The only ones who get to say that we're doing well is us. It is illegitimate if it comes from anyone else. The only true victory would not be if Barack Obama gets to the White House or if Sheila Jackson Lee gets to keep her government job. The only true victory would be to transform the lot of the group. When the entire group of former slaves, when our condition is transformed as a group, then you can talk about victories or rather we can talk about victories because you know damn well white supremacy would not be touting that. White supremacy ain't about to look at black people as a group rising and saying, oh, this is a good thing. They would look at that and say, uh, has America gone too far? Get, hey, think about that. OK, I can tell you right now when tangibles becomes a reality that the white media as a group, you will see Jeff Bezos, Washington Post. You'll see Time magazine. You'll be seeing all of them saying, well, has the welfare state gotten too big? The biggest example of welfare in human history was reparations. They will treat that as an event worse than 9-11. You start having America cutting a check for the former slaves and they will treat that like a Pearl Harbor event, a date that will live in infamy. They will treat it as if it was the Holocaust. They'll treat it as if it was the worst thing that ever happened in human history. So I'm going to close out this little evening address by repeating once again that Sheila Jackson Lee's support for Jonathan Capehart's cravenly, cowardly, and perverted attack on reparations proponents, Jay-Z coming out as the official human shield for the NFL's racism. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but it shouldn't. And if it came as a surprise to you, I don't know what I'm going to do with you then. You already know that I have never mentioned these clowns for a reason, and now you know what that reason is. A lot of you got all hot and bothered about H.R. 40, and some of you convinced yourselves that Sheila Jackson Lee was on our side. The only people who are on our side are the ones who have declared themselves on our side. Who do you see speaking up? Who do you see reaching out to us? Everybody knows about us. You would think that you would have these black representatives in Congress saying, hey, let me call in to the Black Authorities program. Let me call in to Tariq's program. Hey, we need to invite these guys up to Capitol Hill. Hey, we need to be having these guys speaking to us. We need to find a way to elevate their profile. We need to be talking to these guys. We need to be doing whatever we can to magnify and their to magnify their presence and to make them as prominent as possible. Hey, we got some folks out here at the grassroots actually making some moves, actually pushing the agenda, but they haven't. And that tells you everything you need to know. None of them has reached out to us. None of them. Jason Black exposed H.R. 40. Then Sheila Jackson Lee went on Joy Reid's sideshow, and that should have been proof positive right then and there that this woman has always been on the side of team white supremacy. After that, most of you realize what a mistake it had been to ever believe in that woman in the first place. But she got a few of you back to drinking the Kool-Aid when she presided over that congressional fraud, that farce, a few months back. But I imagine that all of that is done now. and It's a shame that this is what it takes to get black folks to understand and recognize an enemy. I mean, you got to apparently Sheila Jackson Lee has to in order for us to recognize an enemy, they got to get out there with a neon sign the size of a barn. Apparently, that's what it takes. You got to write it in boxcar size letters for black folks to see it. While I am disgusted at the behavior that I've seen from these three chumps this week, I'm not surprised. 
White power has spent centuries mastering the art of cultivating black flunkies to run interference for it. When white power is planning to attack us, their first move is to send in a forward element, some black bootlicks, to tell us, oh, don't be worried about those white supremacists over there with the guns and the chains and, and the guys with the torches. Don't be surprised. Don't, don't, be, don't be worried about them. That's always been their first move. You got to soften up your target and you soften up the target by telling them lies, trying to fill their head with lies about what you intend to do. Try to mislead them as to your intentions. And as Jason Black aptly put it, when you got a group of people who you plan to sell up the river, the best way to pull it off is to get one of their own to do it. Now, let's go ahead and get over our revulsion at what's been going on. This is what race war looks like. Race war has always been carried out under the auspices of getting some of the target groups, some of the target demographic, get them to sell the lies for whoever the aggressor group is. That's always been a classic tactic. You had the Judenrat in Nazi Germany. You had Jews who were actually thinking that they were going to collaborate with the Nazis, and the only thing that happened to them in the end was they got the honor of being the last ones on the cattle cars. And we already know that slavery in Africa could not have happened were it not for some sniveling, subservient Negroes who went along with it, who decided, I'll sell out this tribe over here. And the only thing that happened was they had the honor of being the last one slapped in chains. The extermination of the Native Americans in the United States. You had a number of Native American tribes like the Cherokee who played along with the European invaders. And what happened was they got to walk the Trail of Tears. So yeah, when it comes time to target a group of people, you got to start off by getting some of their own to go along with the okie doke. But what I need is for my people to understand what's happening. This is merely the beginning of what is going to be a torrent of black flunkies coming out of the woodwork to cheerlead for white supremacy, and they're going to be aiming their guns at us. That CNN show, if you thought that what Jonathan Capehart did was disgusting, and filthy and evil and vile well you're gonna have four negroes coming at us they didn't choose those fools at random they chose four people who the new voices of black media have been exposing and opposing for a long time andrew gillum the reason he ain't governor is because of us bakari sellout the reason that he was sent back to private life and ain't got a snowball's chance in hell of becoming dog catcher much less governor is because of us Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. The reason that this woman still ain't got a gig in government is because of us. We are damaging white supremacy's tools. And Jonathan Capehart, he needs to be the next one who gets that spotlight put on him. You call yourself attacking the sons and daughters of America's slaves, you will be held accountable. Sheila Jackson Lee, I hope she's making out her resume to whatever lobbying group she's going to try to apply to. Maybe she'll do like Condoleezza Rice. Maybe she'll go ahead and find some NFL or NBA or some sort of white corporation that she can be the black front woman for. She's got plenty of practice being white supremacy's black front woman. She's good at it. She might as well stick with it. But what she won't do is have the good offices of foundational blacks anymore. That she will not have. We can take that from her. We must. Now is the time for us to show our power. And we show our power by focusing our group will. When we start showing that the people who attack our interest and who work against our interest, that we have the power to punish them, we have the power to deny them high office, we have the power to expose them, we have the power to deny them whatever kind of economic goodies and giveaways white power was offering. When we show we got the power to do that, then what's going to happen is a lot of these clowns are going to be a hell of a lot less eager to speak against us. Because that's what happens when you wield power. Now, a lot of you are looking and going, well, at what point do we take on the white supremacists directly? In time. In time. Power is used as a shield long before it's used as a sword. We're going to, first of all, stop all of these slings and arrows being thrown at us first. That's the first order of business. We can't be exposing all of... We cannot be just absorbing all of these attacks all the time. We can't be having these scumbags taking pot shots at us all the live long day. We cannot have that. 
At some point, we're going to we have to make sure we start to disincentivize white supremacy's black flunkies from thinking that it's the same old game of we're going to get in white power's good graces by attacking black folks. We're going to put a stop to that. And that's where the shield comes into play, making sure that these attacks, that we don't have to absorb these attacks anymore. From there, in time, as we build our strength, then we start not wasting our time with white supremacy's black flunkies. Now we'll have enough power where we can start going after white supremacy's head honchos directly. But you start by punishing these internal sock puppets for white supremacy who have been attacking us. You start by making it where white supremacy's flunkies, they're the ones who find, they're the ones who are going to be feeling the heat first. Show that we can exercise power over white supremacy's black flunkies. Show that we can decide whether or not these clowns get to have a cable job. Show that we decide who speaks for the black community and won't be them. Render them impotent and powerless. And more importantly than that, punish them. Charge a price for it. Their careers, poof, gone. Their cable gigs, gone, because white supremacy doesn't need a tool that's ineffective. Make it where any sort of government post they thought they'd have, well, you're not going to have anything now because the only people who can get you there are black folks. You're not going to be using us as a stepping stone to a life of comfort and wealth under white supremacy. You won't be using us as a means to incentivize white supremacy to put you on the payroll. Let's start by cleaning house, family. We know that a lot more of this crap's coming down the pike. Stay on your guard. Be at the ready. Call this crap out when you see it. But understand something. You're not going to have a shortcut to having to build power on your own as a group. There won't be a shortcut. You're not going to be running to any Jay-Z's. You're not going to be running to any Denzel Washingtons. You're not going to be running to any black bootlicks in the white media and saying, well, if we can just get Joy Reid to get us on her show, and if we can just get Jonathan Capehart to mention us, these guys were are on Team White Supremacy. You don't get on MSNBC without being on Team White Supremacy. You don't get the Washington Post to print your stuff and to not attack you. Unless you're on team white supremacy, because you see, if the white media does allow one Negro to to go ahead and push the pro reparations line, if they allow an actual foundational black to push the line aggressively and purposely, then what will happen is they'll also make sure to run three opinion pieces by some dyed in the wool white supremacist shills attacking them. Remember that article that was written last week by Professor Black Truth that got printed in the Washington Post? Well, we've got Jonathan Capehart, and we've got Juan Williams, and we've got Thomas Sowell, and we've got we've got Jesse Lee Peterson. They they're gonna they would print a, just a flood of nonsense, prop garbage propaganda to the contrary. They make sure of that anytime you say something, just one thing that's actually in black people's interest, white supremacy comes out the gate with at least 20 to 30 against it. That's power, part of how they maintain their advantage. You speak the truth once, then they got to bury the truth under a mountain of lies. Now, whether or not they're successful comes down to us and how disciplined we are. No one speaks for us except for us. And no one is going to topple white supremacy except for us. But here's the good news. We don't need any of these clowns. You're trying to find some black millionaire because you think that he's going to use the resources the white supremacy put in his pocket. These clowns want to be part of white supremacy, okay? White supremacy did not have to intimidate them. These guys, they were drooling at the mouth for a spot on team white supremacy. They're not about to fight against the very group that they've been dying to be part of. As they see it, they will gladly turn black America, they will gladly turn the former slaves into human sacrifices on the altar of getting a pat on the head from Massa. See, getting a pat on the head may make Jonathan Capehart's empty, rancid little heart go pitter-pat. That might be good enough for him, but it ain't good enough for us. So stop asking white supremacy's black bootlicks and tools to join the side of the angels. They're not going to do that. But here's the beautiful thing. We don't need them and don't want them. We are the power here, not them. Besides, what, you're going to be spending the next thousand years begging celebrities and athletes and actors, who, by the way, are not the best and brightest among us. These are not the people you need to be looking to anyway for ideas or leadership. I would have thought that black media would have impressed that upon you by now. Stop falling into the same old failed patterns of the past. Stop letting white media lead you around by the nose. 
Stop letting a bunch of black aspirants to be on team white supremacy keep fooling and bamboozling you. You're supposed to be better than that. High time we started acting like it. If we're going to be serious about our interests, first thing we got to be serious about is what we're interested in. We are interested in power for ourselves. We are not interested in having people who are not best suited to press our interest to be out there for us. We are the ones best suited to push our agenda. And we look to ourselves and ourselves alone. Now you start doing that and what you're going to find is these black puppets all of a sudden, they're going to start to wither away. White supremacy will look and say, well, these guys will be freaking useless. We're not throwing good money after bad. But more importantly than that, they're going to be looking and going, well, hell, uh, we better change our tune. Look at Roly Poly Martin. He's been trying to figure out a way to camouflage himself as one of us for the longest time. Yeah, he th I guess he figured that weekend anchor gig that he was pining for on MSNBC, that didn't materialize. So now, as far as he's concerned, I I'm going to try to build something on YouTube. Uh, what? I hope y'all give me some donations. Donations for what? You can look at that dude's waistline and you can see where all your donations have been going to. Your donations have been going to the local Dunkin' Donuts. No, the time for us to play the fool for all of these black flunkies, that time is over. The time of white supremacy getting us to subsidize those who work against us, that time is over. Stop looking to black celebrities. Stop looking to black athletes. Stop looking to the black misleadership class like Sheila Jackson Lee. These guys are nothing more than white supremacy systems of control. You want to bring down the machine, you're going to have to make your peace with the fact that a whole lot of Negroes who you thought were supposed to represent our success, they have represented our oppression. They have represented our subjugation. Jay-Z does not represent black progress. He represents black oppression. Sheila Jackson Lee does not represent black progress. She represents black repression. Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side, she doesn't represent black progress. None of these clowns do. You got to make your peace with that. These are lies that white media told you. Lies that they got some black folks like Jesse Jackson and got some of these other empty headed Negroes, some of whom may not necessarily be on team white supremacy. But the problem is they've been doing the yeoman's work for white supremacy because they haven't been opposing it. Too many of them have been talking stupid, which to me is a distinction without a difference. You may not be on team white supremacy, but if you keep using the wrong verbiage and saying the wrong things, you might as well be. No, we're getting serious about cleaning house. The only ones that we trust are the ones who came from our ranks, from the grassroots. Did you come from the soil? White supremacy has laid bare exactly what the coming agenda is. We, I've warned you about this for like seven years now that this was going to happen. And now here it is. I told you at some point they were going to come at us directly. And when they did, they were going to make it a clear frontal assault. There would be, see, Capehart talks about nuance. I had a nuanced piece. I, I wrote a nuanced piece. You notice how the nuance never had anything to do with complimenting the ADOS movement, complimenting the reparations movement, complimenting the new voices of black media. Notice how that wasn't part of his nuance. It was just a straightforward, stop asking white, stop demanding that you get tangible. Stop demanding anything that you can have in your bank account. Stop that. There was no nuance at all. It was as black and white as you, as you like. But he claimed that there is no substitute for an apology. No, there is no substitute for tangibles. There is no substitute for something that I own, something that I control, and something that I can pass down to the next generation. There is no substitute for that. And I hope that with the cowardly, cravenly, just stabby in the back behavior of these black flunkies that we've seen on display, I hope that now it's becoming clear to all of you that just as there's no substitute for tangibles, there is also no substitute for the new voices of black media.